Well, thank you. And I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Steven Pinker, who is a cognitive scientist, experimental psychologist, linguist, and best-selling popular science author. Steve also serves as FFRF's honorary president and has kindly recorded a 30-second commercial for FFRF that runs on CBS, has run on CBS's Sunday morning and late night with Stephen Colbert, among other outlets. Come here. Steve Pinker is the Johnstown family professor in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University and is known for his advocacy of evolutionary psychology and the computational theory of mind. He was born in Montreal um, and is one of the world's most foremost writers on language and human uh, nature. Uh, uh, Pinker uh, has previously taught at Stanford and MIT and received eight honorary doctorates as well as several teaching awards at MIT and Harvard. He writes for such publications as the New York Times, The Atlantic, and is author of 12 books, including The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, The Blank Slate, The Better Angels of Our Nature, and Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, and Humanism and Progress, which sounds a lot like the FFRF motto, or at least it should be. Steve's newest book, which also directly relates to FFRF's mission, is called Rationality, What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, Why It Matters. Stephen Pinker has served as editor or advisor of numerous scientific and scholarly uh, media and uh, humanist organizations, including the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the National Science Foundation, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Psychological Association, the Linguistic Society of America. He was listed in Prospects Magazine, the, uh, the world's top 100 public intellectuals, Foreign Policy's 100 Global Thinkers, Time Magazine's the, the 100 Most Influential People in the World Today, and he uh, has also received FFRF's Emperor Has No Clothes Award. He is married to the author and philosopher Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein and is an honorary director of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. We have uh, copies of his book, which will be available um, in, the, in the back, Enlightenment Now, um, as well as his brand new book, Rationality, that's all the announcements at this time. Please welcome FFRF's honorary president, the distinguished Steven Pinker. Thank you. It's an honor to return to the Freedom From Religion Foundation annual meeting. I debuted my previous book, Enlightenment Now, at the annual meeting in Madison. This is not a uh, debut lecture for rationality, but it came out pretty recently, so it is one, one of the first. Also an honor to succeed my neighbor, Jay Wexler. Uh, Jay and I live in the same apartment building, which I guess should be designated as the, uh, the regional office of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. <laughs> Rationality presents us with a puzzle. On the one hand, our species has walked on the moon, taken photographs of our planet, plumbed the secrets of the cosmos, of life, of mind. We have fought back against the horsemen of the apocalypse, the scourges that immiserated life for our ancestors for most of our existence, decimating the human toll from war, from famine, from extreme poverty from child mortality. At the same time, a majority of Americans aged 18 to 24 think that astrology is very or sort of scientific. <laughs> Large proportions believe in conspiracy theories, such as that COVID vaccines are a plot to implant microchips into our bodies by Bill Gates or that the American deep state houses a cabal of Satan-worshipping cannibalistic pedophiles. 
Large numbers of us consume fake news, such as Obama signs executive order banning the Pledge of Allegiance in schools nationwide. Or Yoko Ono, I had an affair with Hillary Clinton in the 1970s. <laughs> Many of us believe in paranormal woo-woo, such as possession by the devil, extrasensory perception, ghosts and spirits, witches, and spiritual energy in mountains, trees, and crystals. This is the puzzle I tried to deal with in my book, Rationality, What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, Why It Matters. Well, let's begin at the beginning. What is rationality? I think a definition that captures our intuition best is the use of knowledge to attain goals. And my favorite characterization of the difference between a rational agent and a superficially similar entity that we would not credit with rationality comes from William James, the namesake of the building that I work at at Harvard University, William James Hall, who noted, Romeo wants Juliet as the filings want the magnet. And if no obstacles intervene, he moves toward her by as straight a, path, a line as they. But Romeo and Juliet, if a wall be built between them, do not remain idiotically pre pressing their faces against the opposite sides like the magnet and filings with the card. Romeo soon finds a circuitous way, by scaling the wall or otherwise, of touching Juliet's lips directly. With the filings, the path is fixed. Whether it reaches the end depends on accidents. With the lover, it is the end which is fixed. The path may be modified indefinitely. That is, a, I think, a good characterization of rationality. It raises the question, how can knowledge be used to attain goals? And the answer comes from normative models, a set of tools of, uh, that specify how one ought to reason if one uh, wants to attain goals rationally, different models for different goals. For example, there is logic, the uh, set of tools for deducing new true propositions from existing ones. And each one of the normative models also sets a benchmark against which we can compare uh, ordinary human common sense reasoning. Uh, in the case of logic, uh, an awareness of logic can help us avoid fallacies such as affirming the consequent. Every creative genius was laughed at in, uh, in his time. People laugh at my ideas. Therefore, I'm a creative genius. <laughs> Probability. The likelihood of an event depends on the number of occurrences as a proportion of the number of opportunities. Uh, an awareness of how to calculate probability helps us avoid fallacies like the availability bias, in which the subjective likelihood of, of an event depends on how easily you can recall anecdotes and images. Illustrated in uh, the following SMBC cartoon, this is why people should learn statistics. The woman says, I will not fly in a plane. They aren't safe from terrorists. Hold on, I'll text you an article about it. <laughs> Bayes' rule. <clears throat> we should give credence to a hypothesis to the extent that it's credible a priori, that is, it has high priors. It's consistent with the evidence, and the evidence is uncommon across the board. That allows us to avoid fallacies such as base rate neglect, as in uh, a, a woman I know whose uh, young daughter, um, two-year-old daughter, uh, suffered from twitches. A family doctor said, oh, perhaps she has Tourette syndrome, because Tourette's uh, uh, patients tend to have twitches, ignoring the fact that Tourette syndrome is rare in the population, whereas twitches are common. Uh, and this uh, friend of mine rediscovered Bayesian reasoning, just working it through for herself. The theory of rational choice, a rational actor chooses the option with the greatest expected utility, that is the probability times the payoff. And among other fallacies it helps us avoid are buying extended warranties, which a uh, <laughs> large percentage of American consumers do. Does it really make sense to take out a health insurance policy on your toaster? Signal detection theory. A fallible observer cannot know whether an observation is real, a signal, or bogus noise, and must set a decision cutoff that trades off misses and false alarms according to their costs. 
This allows us to avoid fallacies such as, we should deal with misconduct by making it easier to convict the accused. In the absence of heightening the sensitivity of forensic methods, this is exactly equivalent to saying we should uh, punish more innocent people. Game theory, how to make rational choices when the payoffs depend on someone else's rational choices. Well, an awareness of game theory can help us avoid fallacies such as we can avoid climate change just by convincing everyone that it's in their interests to conserve. The problem being that, in fact, it is not in the interests of any individual uh, to conserve unless everyone else is making the same decision at the same time and is guaranteed to stick with it. Otherwise, a person who conserves suffers the misery of waiting for a, a bus in the rain, uh, shivering in the winter, sweltering in, in the uh, summer, while his compatriots enjoy the comfort of cars and air conditioners and heaters. His sacrifice won't save the planet uh, even if everyone else is conserving, he could be a free rider and enjoy all the benefits of consuming fossil fuels. And once again, uh, his decision will, will uh, not by itself harm uh, the planet. The, uh, it is, to be sure, in everyone's interest if everyone conserves, but it's in no one's interest to conserve individually. Finally, causal inference. To distinguish causation from correlation, one must manipulate the putative cause, holding all else constant. And this allows us to avoid fallacies like failing to rule out confounds. My favorite illustration comes from an old joke in which a Orthodox Jewish couple uh, um, beseech their rabbi for advice. The wife is sexually unsatisfied, and it is written in the Talmud that a man is responsible for his wife's sexual pleasure. Well, the rabbi strokes his beard, and he says, well, here's an idea. Why don't you hire a young, strapping, uh, handsome young ma man, and the next time you make love, have him wave a towel over you, and the fantasies will help the, the missus uh, achieve satisfaction. Well, they try it, and sure enough, uh, nothing happens. They go back to the rabbi, and he strokes his beard again, and he says, um, well, this time let's try a, a slight variation. This time we'll have the uh, young man make love to the wife, and you, the husband, will wave the towel. Well, they try it, and sure enough, she achieves a earth-shaking, screaming orgasm. And the husband says, says to the man, schmuck, now that's the way you wave a towel. <laughs> well, <clears throat> this raises the question, do people follow normative models of rationality? How well do we stack up against these benchmarks? Well, let me give you an example from logic. Consider a uh, decks of cards in which every card has a number on one side and a letter on the other. And here's a possible rule to test. If a card has a D on one side, then it has a three on the other. What are, which are the fewest number of cards that you have to turn over to test whether the rule applies to that deck of cards? You've got a D, you've got an F, <clears throat> you've got a three, and you've got a seven, okay? If there's a D on one side, there's a three on the other. And every card has a number on one side and a letter on the other. Okay, so ponder this uh, for a second. Um, <clears throat> most people say D or D and three. The correct answer is D and seven. And very few people get it. Uh, why? Well, everyone knows you have to turn over the D card because if you turn it over and there's no three on the other side, the rule is false. Pretty much everyone knows that there's no point in turning over the F card. The rule says nothing about the F one way or another. A lot of people think you have to turn over the three card, but when you think about it, that is irrelevant because the rule says if D, then three, not if three, then D. Turning over the three card to test the rule would be an example of a fallacy of uh, affirming the consequent. Uh, but you do have to turn over the seven card. Think about it. You turn over the seven card and there's a D on the other side. Well, that falsifies the rule. If D on one side, then three on the other, the law of contraposition. Uh, a simple explanation is that people are vulnerable to confirmation bias. Namely, they seek evidence that confirms their uh, beliefs, but uh, are not so good at seeking evidence that would falsify them. Let me give you an example from Bayesian influ uh, in inference. The probability that a woman has breast cancer is 1%. That's the base rate in the population. If she does have cancer, the probability that she tests positive is 90%. That's the sensitivity of the test. 
If she does not have breast cancer, the probability that she nevertheless tests positive is 9%. That's the false positive rate. A woman tests positive, what is the chance that she actually has the disease? Okay, again, let's let it sink in for a couple of seconds. The most popular answer, including among doctors, is 80 to 90% chance she, she uh, does have the disease. The correct answer, according to Bayes' rule, is 9%. That's a big difference, uh, particularly when it's uh, an error made by exactly the professionals that are uh, entrusted with interpreting medical tests for us. And uh, you can just imagine your own emotional reaction uh, if you were presented with one or the other uh, interpretation. The common explanation is that it's an example of base rate neglect, that people ignore priors, at least base rates, and they base judgment on representative uh, stereotypes, in this case, the stereotype of having the, uh, having the disease and testing positive. Well, what do we make of these fallacies? One interpretation is the one uh, that endorsed by our hero from Star Trek, humans are irrational. <laughs> but not so fast. Uh, and there was a reason that the second term in the subtitle of my book is why uh, rationality seems scarce rather than why uh, it is scarce. Here's a twist on the logic problem. If a bar patron is drinking beer, he must be over 21. You're a bouncer in a bar and have to enforce the rule. Who do you check? There's a guy drinking beer. Do you have to card him to check his age? There's a guy drinking Coke. Do you have to card him to check his age? There's a guy who's clearly over 21. Do you have to look into his cup to see what he's drinking? There's a guy who's clearly under 21. Do you have to look into his cup to see what he's drinking? Well, in this case, everyone says you've got to card the guy drinking beer, and you've got to look into the cup of the teenager. Uh, these are the correct answers, although this is logically isomorphic to the card selection problem. And uh, all of a sudden, everyone turns into a perfectly good logician sometimes called the content effect, that people are indeed illogical with problems couched in abstract symbols, P's and Q's and D's and 3's, but they can be logical with certain types of meaningful content, such as obligations and precautions. What do you have to do to detect someone who is violating an obligation, for example? Well, here's a twist on the probability problem. 10 in every 1,000 women have breast cancer. Of these 10 women, nine will test positive, of the 990 women without breast cancer, about 89 will nonetheless test positive. That's the false positive uh, number. A woman tests positive, what is the chance that she actually has breast cancer? Well, this, this time, people can think, well, gee, all in all, there are 98 positive test results. Of those, nine have the disease. Nine out of 98 is about 9%. Therefore, um, she, the, the, that is the probability that the uh, woman has uh, actually has the disease. This time, 87% of doctors get it right instead of 9%. Uh, and even 10-year-olds, a uh, majority of them, get it right. The, an explanation is that we are seeing here the difference between natural frequencies, that is, proportions over the long run, which is the way in which we actually encounter events in our lives, People don't give us the probability of a single event, which when you think about it is a somewhat exotic concept. What does it mean to say that I have a 6% chance of having prostate cancer at this very moment? You know, either I have it or I don't. What does the probability apply to me actually me? And indeed, it is not such an intuitive concept. On the other hand, a collection of individuals, some proportion of which have a condition, is perfectly intuitive. So a better conclusion about human rationality is that people use ecological rationality in the sense that they can reason about content relative, relevant to their lives, mixed together with their subject matter knowledge, and they can estimate probabilities as they encounter sequences of events in their lives. People have more trouble with formal rationality. That is, they haven't mastered abstract formulas and rules and tools that can apply to any content with variables like P and Q and X and Y and, uh, y and H and D in which you can plug anything in no matter how unfamiliar. These have to be learned in school, or I hope from, from uh, reading my book, and consciously deployed. 
Well, now the question that everyone is uh, waiting for, I know this because uh, what, as soon as I told people I was teaching a course on rationality and then writing a book on rationality, the frequently asked question was, if people can be rational, why does humanity seem to be losing its mind? <laughs> How do you explain, Professor, the conspiracy theories and fake news and post-truth rhetoric and, and uh, paranormal woo-woo? Not an easy question to answer, and I think at least four, the, the explanation has at least four parts. The most obvious is motivated reasoning. I mentioned that rationality is always in service of a goal. That goal is not necessarily objective truth. Uh, it can also be to win an argument in which the stakes matter to you. It's not surprising that tobacco companies um, deploy considerable ingenuity to try to persuade us that smoking is harmless. Uh, and as Upton Sinclair said, it, it is uh, hard to get a man to understand something when his livelihood depends on not understanding it. To show how wise and moral your group is, your religion, your tribe, your political sect, and how stupid and evil the opposing one is, called the My Side Bias, subject of an uh, important new book by the psychologist Keith Stanovich, The Bias That Divides Us, in which he argues that this is the most robust and pervasive of the cognitive biases documented by psychology. Similarly, uh, we can deploy our reason to gain status and avoid being ostracized as a hero for our own side, leading to a kind of tragedy of the rationality commons. Uh, just as uh, in the classic example of the tragedy of the commons from game theory, it is in the interests of every shepherd to bring add his sheep to, the, to graze on the town commons. On the other hand, when too many shepherds do it, the grass will be grazed faster than it can uh, grow back. The commons is denuded, and then all the sheep's sheep uh, starve. What's rational for an individual may not be rational for all individuals considered collectively. And likewise, if all of us try to, to uh, advance the uh, correctness and the nobility of our side, everyone could be acting rationally individually, while the outcome for the entire democracy is uh, less than optimal. Let me give you an example. Is this syllogism valid? If college admissions are fair, then affirmative action laws are no longer necessary. College admissions are not fair. Therefore, affirmative action laws are necessary. Well, uh, uh, you can think about it for a second. In fact, this is not a valid syllogism. It commits the fallacy of denying the antecedent. P implies Q, not P, therefore not Q. That is uh, illogical. And a majority of liberals commit the fallacy, and uh, most conservatives do not. Well, if you ask a conservative for the explanation, they say, well, we told you all along. Liberals are uh, illogical, but not so fast. Here's another syllogism. If less severe punishments deter people from committing crime, then capital punishment should not be used. Less severe punishments do not deter people from committing crime, therefore capital punishment should be used. Another example of the fallacy of denying the antecedent, but this time it's conservatives that commit the fallacy and liberals don't. What the two problems have in common is that in both cases, people ratify the conclusion that is congenial to their political ideology in the first place, and they're not so good at tracking logic that uh, seems to be inconsistent with it. In other words, uh, politics makes you illogical, quite literally. Uh, a second part of the explanation is that we're all vulnerable to primitive intuitions. Part of our legacy from uh, uh, evolution, ways that we make sense of the world in a uh, pre-science society. For example, people are uh, liable to the intuition of dualism. A person has a body and a mind. From there, it's a short step to imagine that there can be minds without bodies, and so you get spirits and souls and ghosts and afterlife, uh, reincarnation, ESP, a carryover from the fact that when we deal with one another, we don't treat each other as robots or, or hunks of meat. We imagine that there is <clears throat> something immaterial, ineffable, invisible going on that happens to be linked to their body, and from there, it's a short step to imagine it unlinked from their body. 
Essentialism. Uh, we, it's natural to think that living things contain some kind of invisible essence or stuff that gives them their form and powers, from which it's a, it's a short step to think that disease is caused by an adulteration of one's essence by some formal contaminant. That makes people resistant to vaccines, and vaccine resistance is as old as vaccines, because when you think about it, uh, the last thing that apparently you want to do to prevent disease is actually inject a version of the disease pathogen into your body, into the tissues of your body. That is deeply unintuitive, but that's what we're asked to do when we get vaccinated. Likewise, genetically modified organisms, known to be completely innocuous, give many people the, the willies. It makes people susceptible to homeopathy and herbal remedies where some healthful, uh, the essence of some healthful substance is thought to be introduced into the body. And it also leads to treatment of disease by purging and bloodletting and fasting and sweating and just getting rid of toxins, uh, folk remedies that have been discovered in uh, culture after culture. We are vulnerable to intuitions of teleology. We know that our plans and artifacts are designed with a purpose, our purpose. From there, it's a short step to imagine that the world is designed with a purpose, leading to beliefs in creationism, astrology, synchronicity, and the vague sense that everything happens for a reason. There are no coincidences. <clears throat> now, these primitive intuitions are unlearned, and objective truths are acquired only by trusting legitimate expertise scientists, historians, journalists, government uh, record-keeping agencies. Few of us can really justify our beliefs, including our true beliefs. Uh, uh, studies have shown that most people can't explain, for example, how a toilet works or a zipper, to say nothing of climate change and, and evolution. And tests of scientific uh, knowledge and scientific sophistication show that creationists and climate deniers are no less scientifically literate than believers. If you poll people who <clears throat> endorse the scientific consensus on anthropogenic climate change, for example, they are at best squirrely about the, uh, the, the science underneath it. A lot of people will say, oh, global warming, does that have something to do with the, the uh, ozone hole or toxic waste dumps, you know, plastic straws in the ocean? Uh, there's just a vague sense of you know, green is good and pollution is bad. What differentiates them is simply political ideology. The farther to the right, the more climate denial. Weird beliefs persist in people who don't trust the establishment, something that is not helped when the establishment flaunts its own ideological commitments and portrays itself as a, a branch of the political left. Finally, uh, I think there's a, a key distinction between what I call realist and mythological beliefs. Let me explain. So why do people believe outlandish fake news and conspiracy theories? Well, part of the answer is it depends what you mean by believe. Uh, Bertrand Russell said, it is undesirable to believe a proposition when there is no ground whatsoever for supposing it is true. I suspect that most people in this room think that this is a obvious, trite, banal, common sense observation. In fact, it is a radical, unnatural manifesto uh, that for most people through most of history, uh, Grounds for believing something are just one of the reasons to hold a proposition. Uh, I suspect that people hold two kinds of beliefs. There's uh, beliefs in, in the reality zone. This is the physical objects around them, the other people that pe they deal with face to face, the memory of their interactions. Even people who believe in um, chemtrails or 9-11 truthers or the lizard people, a lot of them you know, hold jobs and keep food in the fridge and gas in the car and get the kids clothed and fed and off to school on, on time. It's not that they are irrational throughout their lives. It's just certain zones in which they seem to depart from ordinary, verifiable cause and effect reasoning. Uh, in the second zone, the mythology zone, which covers the distant past, the unknowable future, far away peoples and places, remote corridors of power, uh, CEO boardrooms, presidential um, palaces, the microscopic, the cosmic, the counterfactual, the metaphysical. Here, people hold beliefs because they're entertaining, they're uplifting, they're empowering, they're morally edifying. Whether they are true or false is unknowable. 
uh, and irrelevant. And indeed, for most of our history, they were unknowable before we had science and uh, government record keeping and responsible journalism and uh, uh, historians and so on. Some examples, one uh, almost hardly needs to be mentioned in this room, is uh, religion. And a, a remarkable phenomenon that accompanied the publication of the quartet of books by the New Atheists about um, uh, a dozen years ago, Sam Harris, Dan Dennett, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, is that the furious counter-reaction was not so much that they were wrong and that there's here's plenty of evidence to believe in the existence of God, but rather it's somehow just you know, inappropriate or uncouth or, or just not done to consider the existence of God to be a matter of truth and falsity in the first place. You hold it because it is a good thing to believe, not because it is factually accurate. Many people have similar attitudes when it comes to the founding myths of their nation, the, the, the revolutionaries, the founders, the framers, the martyrs, the heroes, the saints that, that uh, uh, originated a country. Historical fiction, uh, do any of us really uh, care whether Henry V gave that stirring speech on St. Crispin's Day that Shakespeare attributed to him, or whether the dialogue in the crown between Charles and Di really took place? Uh, and fake news and conspiracy theories. So as an example, consider Pizzagate, the predecessor of QAnon, according to which Hillary Clinton ran a child sex ring uh, in the basement of Comet Ping Pong, a Washington, D.C. pizzeria. A typical response among holders of this theory was to leave a one-star Google review of the restaurant, saying, uh, and I quote, the pizza was incredibly underbaked and uh, suspicious looking men gave funny looks to my five-year-old son. Now, this, this isn't the kind of reaction you would have if you literally saw that, thought that children were being raped in the basement. Like, the, uh, instead you might call the police. Uh, one thing that can be said for the guy who burst into the restaurant with his guns blazing in a heroic attempt to, to uh, uh, free the children was at least he took his belief seriously. For him, they were in the reality zone. So what, is it, what, is it, what do people mean when they say, I believe that Hillary Clinton ran a child sex ring? Uh, what they really are saying is, I believe Hillary Clinton is so depraved that she's capable of running a child sex ring. Or perhaps even more accurately, boo, Hillary. <laughs> that is, beliefs can be expressions of moral convictions. All this raises the question, how can we become more rational? Um, Again, not a simple answer. I think part of the solution is that the tools of formal rationality should become second nature. Rationality should be the fourth R taught in school together with reading, writing, and arithmetic. Nor the norms of rationality should be promoted. We should have a greater awareness of the fallacies that the unaided human mind is prone to, such as availability, my side bias, arguing ad hominem. Uh, that the general mindset in op-eds, in uh, television debates and arguments, in everyday uh, dinner table conversations, is that our, we should promote the norm that beliefs should be based on evidence and that changing your mind when the evidence changes should be sign, uh, taken as a sign of strength, not of flip-flopping or weakness. Perhaps most important, institutions with rationality promoting rules must be safeguarded. The great achievements of human rationality were not the product of some uh, single genius uh, coming, granting his brainchild to the world, but rather from uh, institutions, societies, professions, in which people voice hypotheses and other people can uh, uh, criticize them. In that way, one person can notice and make up for another's biases, though each of us is rather poor at spotting our own biases, sometimes called the bias bias. That is, all of us think everyone else is biased, but not us. Uh, on the other hand, we're pretty good at spotting other people's biases. And in a community of people where you're allowed to do that, then the collective can uh, become more rational than anyone is individually. Just to be concrete, in that card selection task, if D, then three. When people work alone, about 10% get it right. When people work in small groups, about 70% uh, get it right. All it takes is for one person to spot the correct answer, 
and she or he can, uh, can a majority of the time, convince the others. What do I mean by rationality promoting institutions? We have science with its rules for empirical testing and peer review. We've got democratic government with its checks and balances. As James Madison put it, ambition must be made to, to uh, counteract ambition. Journalism with its mechanisms of editing and fact-checking and cultivating a reputation for accuracy. The ju judicial system with its adversarial proceedings instead of just entrusting uh, verdicts to a hanging judge. Academia, at least in theory, with freedom of inquiry and open debate. And another example is Wikipedia with the uh, system of uh, corrections based on a commitment to neutrality and objectivity. Among electronic media, we can compare Wikipedia unfavorably with social media, where there are rewards for notoriety rather than accuracy, whether they, where the mechanisms encourage rapid response rather than uh, careful sifting and fact-checking. Uh, what it means is that the credibility and, objective, and, and objectivity of these rationality-promoting institutions must be uh, safeguarded. Uh, it's a, they are a precious resource that people are disabused of weird beliefs to the extent that they trust institutions, and uh, that trust has to be earned. Experts should show their work. We should not have public health uh, authorities just giving um, pronouncements like edicts or, or new cases or uh, dogmas, but rather explain the rationale behind their recommendations. Fallibility should be acknowledged. No one's perfect. It is inevitable that people will make mistakes. That brings down the credibility of the whole institution if they were just presented as the pronouncements of an oracle or a priesthood. And gratuitous politicization should be avoided. That's something that, uh, far from getting better, is getting worse as more and more of our institutions brand themselves as branches of the political left. When you have public health authorities say uh, to uh, reduce the spread of COVID, people should stay away from uh, Make America Great Again rallies. But it's OK to attend Black Lives Matter rallies because the cause of social justice is so important that it's worth uh, coming down with COVID. Uh, which is what they said, and which is, to put it mildly, a, a strategic blunder in terms of uh, securing the credibility and objectivity of public health institutions. Finally, why rationality matters. Rationality certainly matters to our lives. Again, this is a, a conclusion that I hardly need to make to this audience. People who do follow the normative models and avoid cognitive fallacies, on average, have fewer accidents and mishaps, better financial health and employment outcomes, and are less likely to be swindled by medical or psychic or, for that matter, religious charlatans. Rationality drives material progress. In Enlightenment Now, I presented a large number of graphs that show that uh, over the decades and centuries, longevity, peace, prosperity, safety, and quality of life have all increased. This leads to another frequently asked question, do you believe in progress? And the answer is uh, no. As with Fran Lebowitz, the uh, New York humorist, I don't believe in anything you have to believe in. The universe contains no force that carries us ever upward. Quite the contrary, it has a number of forces that are at best indifferent to our well-being and at worst uh, appear to be trying to grind us down, pandemics being the most uh, obvious example. Progress comes from deploying reason to improve human flourishing. That is, when people apply their brain power to the goal of making people better off, every once in a while they will succeed if we retain these, the uh, uh, the solutions that make people better off, try not to repeat our mistakes. Bit by bit, things can get better. That's all there is to progress. Perhaps less obviously, rationality drives moral progress. And in an earlier book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined, in which I looked at the uh, historical declines in various forms of violence and oppression, I discovered that many moral movements began with a rational argument. A philosopher or thinker or uh, activist would lay out an argument as to why some practice was 
uh, indefensible or inconsistent with values that people profess to hold. The essay would go viral, would get translated into many languages, would be debated in pubs and salons and coffee houses and dinner parties, eventually influence le leaders and legislators and popular opinion. The conclu conclusion became absorbed into the conventional wisdom and the, everyone's common sense of decency, sometimes erasing the tracks uh, of the original argument that got us there. Uh, for example, few people today uh, could muster a coherent argument about, uh, as to why something might be a wee bit wrong with burning heretics at the stake. But that argument had to be made. It was made, for example, by Sebastian Castellio in the 16th century, who wrote, Calvin says that he is certain, and other sects say that they are. Who shall we judge? In view of the uncertainty, we must define the heretic simply as one with whom we disagree. And if then we're going to kill heretics, the logical outcome will be a war of extermination, since each is sure of himself. Cruel punishments, like breaking on the wheel, or disembowelment, or burning at the stake. Uh, did we actually need a rational argument as to why those were barbaric? Well, yes, and it was provided by Cesare Baccaria, the first utilitarian using principles of expected utility. As punishments become more cruel, the minds of men, which like fluids always adjust to the level of the objects that surround them, become hardened. And after 100 years of cruel punishments, breaking on the wheel causes no more fear than imprisonment previously did. For a punishment to achieve its objective, it is only necessary that the harm it inflicts outweighs the benefit that derives from the crime. And into this calculation ought to be factored the certainty of the punishment and the loss of the good that the commission of the crime would produce. Everything beyond this is superfluous and therefore tyrannical. How about war? Did uh, people need an argument on why war was not good for children and other living things, as we used to say in the uh, 1960s? Well, yes, and Erasmus was probably the first uh, who uh, did a uh, cost-benefit uh, analysis right out of game theory showing that war was a zero-sum game. The advantages derived from peace diffuse themselves far and wide and reach great numbers, while in war, if anything turns out happily, the advantage redounds only to a few. One man's safety is owing to the destruction of another. One man's prize is derived from the plunder of another. The cause of rejoicings made by one side is the other a cause of mourning. Whatever is unfortunate in war is severely so indeed, and whatever on the contrary is called good fortune is a savage and a cruel good fortune, an ungenerous happiness deriving its existence from another's uh, woe. A, a beautiful uh, argument that war is zero sum. Autocracy, did people need to be, uh, to have reasons against the divine right of kings or absolute monarchy? Uh, famously, John Locke provided it. Freedom of men under government is to have a standing rule to live by, common to every one of that society and made by the legislative power erected in it. A liberty to follow my own will in all things where that rule prescribes not, not to be subject to the inconstant, uncertain, unknown, arbitrary will of another man, as freedom of nature is to be under no other restraint but the law of nature. This argument led more than a century later to the, uh, the, the, the framing of the uh, constitution of the uh, experiment in democracy called the United States. And it led in other directions that I suspect Locke could not have anticipated, such as when the first English feminist, Mary Astell, wrote in the 17th century, if absolute certain sovereignty, the 18th century, I'm sorry, be not necessary in a state, how comes it to be so in a family? Or if in a family, then why not in a state, since no reason can be alleged for the one that will not hold more strongly for the other? If men are born free, how is it that all women are born slaves? As they must be if the being subjected to the inconstant, uncertain, unknown, arbitrary will of men, sound familiar, be the perfect condition of slavery. And speaking of slavery itself, it may seem uh, inconceivable that rational arguments should have to be brought to bear against this most uh, barbaric and inhumane of institutions. But in fact, Fred Frederick Douglass did exactly that, um, such as in his speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? which, uh, among other reasons, he noted there are some 
72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which if committed by a black man, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same crimes will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? The manhood of the slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding, under severe fines and penalties, the teaching of the slave to read or to write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. Not only does, uh, has reason guided movements for change, but I believe that reason should guide movements for change. They spell out the difference between moral force and brute force, between marches for justice and lynch mobs, between human progress and breaking things. And they'll be needed to ensure that moral progress continues, that some of the barbaric practices of our own time will come to be seen by our descendants as uh, barbaric as slave auctions and breaking on the wheel seem to us. Finally, I end the book by suggesting that the power of rationality to guide moral progress is of a piece with its power to guide material progress and wise choices in our lives. Our ability to eke increments of well-being out of a pitiless world and to be good to others despite our flawed nature depends on grasping impartial principles that transcend our parochial experience. We are a species that has been endowed with a elementary faculty of reason and that has discovered formulas and institutions that magnify its scope. They awaken us to ideas and expose us to realities that confound our intuitions but are true for all that. Thank you.